Hello and welcome to this MCMA webinar, Controlling and Synchronizing Industrial Machines Using Real-Time Ethernet. My name is Joanna Keel and I'm the Manager of Marketing and Membership for the Motion Control and Motor Association. This webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions panel in your webinar screen and we will answer all questions at the end of this webinar. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Punya Prakash and Sari Germanos. Punya is the business manager for industrial applications in the catalog processor business unit at Texas Instruments. She is responsible for the growth of business opportunities for targeted end equipment in the industrial and energy automation, such as factory automation and control, motors drive, building automation, and grid infrastructure. Her responsibilities range from defining new and differentiated products for this market niche to increasing the profitability of existing products. She facilitates execution of current ideas and also aids in the development of new product concepts based on the exposure to customers and prospects alike. Punya analyzes the market traction to understand customer requirements and to find innovative solutions that scales for broader markets. Sari is the Technology Marketing Manager for Ethernet PowerLink Standardization Group. His expertise lies in developing complex, distributed, real-time, mechatronic applications. He also has significant experience in applying simulation technologies to improve the efficiency of developing large-scale distributed systems. I'd also like to thank our exclusive sponsor of today's webinar, BNR Industrial Automation. As a global leader in industrial automation, BNR combines state-of-the-art technology with advanced engineering to provide customers in various industries with complete solutions for machine automation, motion control, HMI, and integrated safety technology. With industrial field bus communication standards like PowerLink and Open Safety, as well as the powerful Automation Studio software development environment, BNR is constantly redefining the future of automation engineering. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Sari to begin today's presentation. Thank you very much, Joanna. So we're going to start uh, the presentation today by talking about uh, Ethernet concepts, uh, how to use Ethernet for control and automation. And we'll talk about some basic requirements for uh, how to implement a real-time network. And we'll talk about how these real-time uh, requirements are implemented using an open source standard Ethernet PowerLink. We will then talk about use cases and some of the market adoption. What does the market look like today? And then uh, Texas Instruments, uh, mainly Punia, will talk about how this technology is actually implemented in the uh, Satara platform, um, and she will uh, go through a lot of detail there. So this is an example of an ideal automation machine. This machine represents the architecture of a vision-based pick-and-place application. The subsystems include a central controller or PLC, an HMI, a vision camera, uh, robot arms, pneumatics, a rotary encoder, uh, and a safety controller. In this example, all the components are connected through one network, and this network is based on standard Ethernet. So why do we use Ethernet? So Ethernet has been around for a while, since 1972. It's available on all microprocessors uh, we know of today, um, and it's been the main tool used for productivity in office applications. The main issue with, C, with the Ethernet when it comes to automation is that it's based on the CSMA CD protocol. So the idea there is that any two components on the network can talk at the same time uh, or whenever they want, they can speak out of turn. And uh, when two components speak at the same time, you get a collision. When you get a collision, you have to back off and retransmit. And this keeps going until each node has sent its own packet. The greater the number of nodes, the higher the probability of collision, and so you end up with a lot of indeterminism. To solve this problem today, people have introduced the concept of switches, where a switch guarantees a connection between two nodes on the network that, needs to, uh, that need to communicate, and then those two nodes can communicate with zero or minimal collisions. 
Now, when it comes to automation, you have a lot of components that need to speak to each other. Uh, it's very hard to use an off-the-shelf switch because you'll end up with queuing, and if you, use, you end up with queuing, you're back to having determinism. Um, so to avoid this non-deterministic behavior, people use managed switches where the switch has to be configured specifically for the application in use, and these switches tend to be expensive and uh, hard to commission and maintain. So uh, the, in the ideal world, we would try to avoid using a switch because that minimizes switch delays and it makes our, uh, our system much uh, simpler. So what are the ideal network requirements around having a real network for automation? So we will go through these requirements right now and then we'll talk about how these requirements are implemented with the Ethernet PowerLink protocol. So the first requirement is having real-time performance and high efficiency. Of course, you expect that when you're trying to run a machine. You need to have a large asynchronous bandwidth. Uh, the reason for that is uh, components today uh, have to be upgraded in the field, and so you need to be able to download uh, a software upgrade to the, or a firmware upgrade to the component. Uh, that uses a lot of bandwidth. In addition, you also have imaging components on the network today, so you could have a video camera or a vision camera, and uh, that requires some bandwidth as well. You'd like to have one network for all automation. So the big deal here is having slow components and fast components on the same network and, having, and being able to deal with both of these at the same time. Having a flexible network topology is important. Hot pluggable. Uh, you need to be able to replace a component if it dies without having to reboot the machine. You'd like to have high availability because on the manufacturing floor, if, you, if your machine is down or if your network's down, you're going to lose productivity, and that's not a good thing. Uh, being immune to electrostatic noise is really important, and so that's one of the requirements we'll address. And lastly, we'll talk about commissioning, maintenance, and diagnostics, and how that can be made easier using a network. So let's take a look at the first two requirements, having a large, uh, uh, having real-time performance and having a large asynchronous bandwidth. So I'm going to talk about the PowerLink protocol first. So the PowerLink protocol is an Ethernet-based protocol. It is designed to eliminate collisions on the network. And it's based on the concept of having one component on the network that we call the network master or managing node. And then everything else on the network is considered to be a control node. In order to eliminate collisions without the use of a switch, we need to make sure that no component ever speaks out of sequence. So a control node will sit on the network quietly and wait until it's told to communicate. When it communicates, uh, that's when the master tells it to communicate, that's when it communicates. And that's when it puts out one frame per node per cycle. So what is a cycle? So the cycle time is considered to be the time taken for every component on the network to put out a frame. And the cycle in PowerLink is split into two components. During the first phase of the cycle, we call it the synchronous phase, that's when the real-time communication happens. During the second phase of the cycle, we allow a specific amount of bandwidth, which is configurable, and that bandwidth is used for standard IP communication so that you can have asynchronous bandwidth. And uh, that is where you would do things like software upgrades, fast imaging data, or anything that is not time critical. So the cycle starts with the PLC or the controller, uh, which in this case is the managing node. And it puts out the start of cycle frame on the, on the network. The start of cycle frame will tell everybody to synchronize at that point to that frame. And that happens every cycle. Then it puts out a packet called the poll request. And that poll request will go to the first node on the network telling it now it may publish its data. Then it puts out the second poll request to the second node telling it to publish its data. So whenever a node receives a pull request, it puts out a pull response that includes the data that it wants to publish. So here you will see this is the cycle time, the total amount of time taken for everybody to communicate. 
and then the start of cycle frame, first poll request, first poll response, second poll request, second poll response, and on and on until you get the last poll request, the last poll response, then you start the asynchronous communication. So in this scheme, as you've seen, you end up with no collisions because everything is scheduled and timed, and you end up with a, you can load up your network as much as you want without having any delays. So in this situation, you end up with an easy and robust functionality. The time synchronization, as you've seen, is very, very simple. The protocol itself is very simple and everything sits on one medium. Now, one nice feature about PowerLink is that you can do cross communication. So one node can communicate directly with another node without having to go through the master. So let's take a look at the cycle again. Here's your sort of cycle frame. Your first poll request goes. The encoder sees its uh, poll request and it puts out its data. That data will go to everybody at once. So anybody who cares to listen to the encoder can listen to the encoder without the, the data having to go through the PLC. So this is extremely important when you're trying to do synchronized motion. Uh, that way you can have several XCs li listening to several encoders and they can all synchronize without involving the master. We have another form of efficiency called poll response chaining. Rather than sending a poll request to every component on the network, you can send one generic poll request out and then all those components will respond with fixed time delays. This is all uh, programmable at startup. So that way you can pretty, again, load up your network even more and be very, very efficient about it without losing uh, time on the network for the individual poll requests. So what's the big deal about having one single network for all automation? The main thing is, like I said before, you need to have fast components and slow components. What's, an, what's a fast component? Something that has to be read or written every cycle. So something like a drive or an encoder, uh, these are values that you have to look at and communicate with every cycle. So in this example, you have components one, two, and three communicating on cycle one, and then four, five, and six communicate, and then you have your asynchronous frame. Then you start again with components one, two, and three, but this time seven, and eight, and nine use the slots. And then you, one, two, and three go again, and then 10 and 11 you go. So 10 and 11 could be examples of, say, um, a temperature sensor or a pressure sensor where you don't need to communicate that information every cycle whereas components one, two, and three are high frequency components and those guys need to communicate. So in this case, you're multiplexing eight nodes and those eight nodes are only using three slots on the network. So this allows you to take a, a classic structure like this. So here's an example of another machine uh, where you have several buses. That's a typical machine in the field today. You might have a bus that's doing motion control, another bus that's doing I.O., and another bus that's maybe doing some safety communications. Now, here you have different buses, and they all have, they have different requirements. So if you're able to collapse and have only one network in your system, your, your, your system collapses to something that looks like this. So you end up with this one technology. You don't have to uh, debug many buses on the network. You don't have to commission many buses on the network. It's much easier to synchronize the timing between components on the network. And then you end up with a system that's very, very easy to diagnose and maintain. So uh, let's take a look at hot pluggability and uh, high availability. So every component in PowerLink is required to have two Ethernet ports. Those ports are connected internally by an internal hub or repeater. So this allows you to do a structure like this where you might have a PLC and from on one uh, side of the uh, PLC you might have a bunch of I.O. and drives and on the other side you can go to a hub and then fan out to a bunch of components. So this basically allows you to have any kind of a structure you want and you're not limited to a ring or a daisy chain or whatever. You can pretty much do whatever you want in terms of topology. And then because you're using standard ethernet, uh, again, this, is, this means it's very easy to have a hot pluggable system. 
the electrical requirements are already met. You just unplug a component, you plug it in, you plug the new one in, the PLC realizes that you have a new component, it resets the component, programs it, and then you're up and running. Uh, let's talk about high availability. So there are three forms of high availability as far as the network goes. The first one is what we call rig redundancy. Now, if you take a main controller like this and you connect it to a bunch of components that are daisy chained, and then you take the last component in the daisy chain and you connect it back to the main controller, you form the ring. Now, what is special about this ring is that when the controller puts out a pull request, it listens to it on the other side. If the pull request doesn't come back, then the controller knows that there's probably a broken cable somewhere, in which case it starts to communicate on both sides. So if you have only one broken cable in the system, you can still operate, but you know that you have a broken cable and you can notify service, but this, the system will continue to run while it's waiting for service. Another form of high availability is called full medium redundancy. In this case, you can have two concurrent networks running together. Each component in the system is connected to both networks at the same time via a link selector. The link selector is intelligent and knows when a network goes down and it will automatically switch to the second network. So if, if, the, if one network goes down, all the link selectors will automatically switch and then you continue to run. Lastly, you have the concept of a redundant master. Well, in PowerLake, everything is sequenced by the master. So if the master goes down, you don't have a system. So you're allowed to have up to nine additional redundant masters as part of the PowerLink specification. And when one, ma uh, and one redundant master will look at the uh, main master and wait for him to go down, when the main master goes down, it assumes his identity and then continues to run. And if this is implemented correctly, you can do this in two cycles. Uh, let's talk about susceptibility to noise. So um, if you're aware of fast protocols like Ethercat or uh, Circos, these are protocols that uh, use a sum frame. In those protocols, you have one frame that goes around the network. If uh, that frame should, so as the frame goes around the network, each component puts its data in that, what you, what you can think of as a bin of data and passes the bin to the next person. The next person puts his data in the bin and passes the data along. But you have one frame per cycle. So if that frame gets corrupted, then you lose data from the entire cycle. So what will happen with this kind of a scheme is that as you add nodes, your susceptibility to noise goes way up. Comparing that to PowerLink, where each data, each data frame has only data from one component. So if you lose that frame, you only lose a very small portion of your cycle. So your susceptibility to noise as you add more and more nodes remains very, very low, and it only increases linearly. Let's talk about easy commissioning and maintenance. Um, so because we're using hub technology and because we're, we can daisy chain or we can use hubs uh, and because we use broadcast mechanisms, it's very easy to take a tool like Wireshark and put it on the, net, uh, on the network anywhere and you can see all the data that's taking place. So you can take a look at the system sequence. So it becomes very easy to debug the PowerLink network to make sure that all the uh, pull requests and pull the response and start of cycles and start of asynchronous frame are all happening when they're supposed to be happening. And if there's something out of sequence or if there's there are delays, then you can use Wireshark to see that delay. So it becomes very easy to, to debug, it's very easy to maintain, it's very easy to commission. As far as the PowerLink frame goes, we're using standard Ethernet frames. So uh, uh, this is an example of an Ethernet frame. We have a MAC header, source, destination, and your CRC. Uh, the Ethernet payload there is what contains the PowerLink payload. So the PowerLink frame sits completely within the Ethernet payload. It's got its own header, message type, etc. 
Now you'll notice that the ether type for the power link frame is x 8 av that is a registered ether type. So that is recognizable by a tool like Wireshark. So within the power link payload itself, that's where you see IO data, drive data, et cetera. And then there's also a data that's reserved for safety. As far as the OSI model goes, uh, PowerLink is basically a layer seven application. Uh, you'll see terms like PDO and SDO, and that's because PowerLink is effectively can open over, uh, over Ethernet. So it uses the same uh, communication mechanisms and protocols. As far as fiving goes, um, this is just an example, but if you can have an example of uh, 17 stations with 800 digital I.O., 180 analog I.O., 24 axes of motion, you can run a system like that theoretically with a 200 microsecond cycle time. So uh, the protocol is very, very efficient and very fast. Here is an, a real example of a company in Germany called Bruckner. Uh, they've uh, developed a plastic stretching machine. This uh, is the plastic that's used on your laptops or your TV screens. So in this machine, as the plastic goes through the machine, you have 720 XCs that are being controlled for actuating and pulling and stretching the, the plastic uniformly. And this system is running with a 400 microsecond cycle time or 728 axes of motion. So we call this the world's fastest network because this is the fastest application that we're aware of today. Uh, one, in, one interesting thing to note is that in China in 2011, PowerLink was designated a GB slash T standard. Uh, GB means it's government uh, uh, approved and GB slash T means it's government recommended. So once it became a government recommended standard, uh, in 2011, we started getting a lot of OEMs in China building their OE, their systems on PowerLink. And because of that, now we see about 24,000 downloads of the PowerLink stack a year from the open source uh, SourceForge website. So a little bit about the Ethernet PowerLink standardization group. Um, we are basically an organization that is tasked with maintaining the PowerLink standard, and we also maintain a standard called Open Safety, which is a safe communication standard that sits on top on top of PowerLink. Uh, Open Safety itself is uh, two certified uh, SOL3 uh, compliant um, and 61508 uh, meets 61508 standards as well. So. Um, PowerLink itself is an open source protocol. There are no license fees or patents, and it's based on the BSD uh, licensing model. And you can get onto ethernetpowerlink.org and download the spec, or you can go to the SourceForge website for PowerLink. You can just Google SourceForge and PowerLink, and you'll find the website, and you can download the source code. So it meets the standards uh, that you would expect an ethernet protocol to meet. Um, and uh, just a little bit about the market share today. Um, the market worldwide today, there's about 30% of the market that is running Ethernet IP. This is the whole market of, of uh, machines. Another 30% running Profinet, that's the Siemens standard. Um, you will find a whole bunch of uh, smaller protocols that fit within the segment. There's still a large segment of Modbus machines out there. It's about 17% of the market. And then you'll see about 9% of PowerLink and about 7% of EtherCAP. But realistically, the 7% and the 9%, this pretty much is an indication of the actual real-time market. Generally, Ethernet IP and Profinet cannot run um, at the rates that we're talking about with 400 microsecond cycle times and uh, very large uh, amounts of data. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand this over to Punya, and she's going to ex explain some of the magic that happens on the CI Citara platform that allows PowerLink to run at the rate that it does. So Thank you, sorry. There we go. Okay. All right. Hello, folks. This is Punya Prakash uh, from Texas Instruments. Um, to be able to present our processor solutions enabling the power link technology that Sari just outlined in the first half of the presentation. 
the topics I would like to essentially cover today would be our industrial Ethernet solution on the processors and the range of the portfolio of processors that we have today that enables the integrated industrial Ethernet solutions. And subsequently, dig a little bit deeper, providing an overview of what our PowerLink solution is on the TI processors. So to start with, a, a brief introduction on Texas Instruments. We are a global semiconductor company with presence, worldwide presence, with a large sales and support infrastructure. We have a broad portfolio of products that covers beyond embedded processors, inclusive of analog ICs. And as you look at the system level, our key emphasis is to provide a cohesive system solution with also significant investments as you look at the software and tools to enable the system solution. Um, so for the discussion today and for our Texas Instruments, or TI's um, investments, we will be specifically focusing on our industrial solution. So to start with, as we look at the industrial solution given the topic today, which is very uh, centered around the communication, I would like to start with giving a brief overview on the topology as we see it in the industrial market. So at the low end, you have your field IOs where you have the actual manufacturing. I see two key end equipments as we look at the field level. Uh, one is the IO sensors and the other being the drives. These are typically connected to the control layer where we have PLCs and motion control kind of solutions. Depending on the end number of nodes, which was one of the topics that Sari mentioned earlier in the in the webinar was also the number of nodes and the quality of service as you look at the topology. So that kind of defines on what level of performance you need in this control layer. And as you look at the operator level, that is where we see a dominance of the HMI solutions. Uh, control level is typically abstracted, and at IO level, there may be some user interface, but that's really low end HMI solutions. Now, as we look at Texas Instrument solutions that we have to offer for this kind of an industrial automation system, our key focus is on innovation. And when I say innovation, we have invested in ARM technology and providing integrated silicon with ARM technology for years now. To add to that and to be able to differentiate and innovate for the industrial market, we've added the PRU ICSS architecture which enables an integrated protocol industrial communication solution. We enable this integration uh, to be able to provide a lower power fanless design, which is critical for such industrial solutions. Now, as you look at the topology of the industrial automation solutions, there is a wide range of performance calibers. It, it could be an MCU class of processors or a very higher performance, higher MIPS requiring for a processor class of device. And you may need a single core processor or maybe you want to split the processing between control and communication, which would uh, call for a multi-core architecture. And as you look at the operating system, depending on the kind of latency and the kind of functionality, you could have a requirement for a high-level operating system to, say, leverage something like a Linux operating system and HMI, or a, a hard latency-based real-time operating system. Our processor business unit, which is what I am representing today, provides a varied solutions here as we look at ARM-only solutions or ARM plus the integrated industrial communication solution or an option to scale up to the higher end where you have the HMI solution where you can leverage the graphic solution to be able to render the display. And with these solutions being pin-to-pin -pin compatible, it provides a very scalable portfolio of products, which leads into the quality, reliability, as well as availability as we look at the industrial market. So, what, as we look at industrial communication, where that fits into this topology, it really is a part, essential part of every single of these end equipment. It could be, it is a key for HMI to be able to communicate to the control level where you have the PLCs as well as the sensor and the industrial drives on the lower end with the field level. And as we look at each of these end equipment, it is critical to have 
industrial communication to be able to connect these ads lower latency and provide a very deterministic, reliable communication. TI is uniquely positioned to provide this scalable solution, not just from a processor portfolio, but also the analog attached to it and the software that enables the communication for these applications. So what is the TI solution and, and a brief view into what the PRU ICSS is. Traditionally, we have seen that a lot of these industrial automation uh, solutions have an MCU or an MPU, which typically runs the protocol stack. And you have an external solution, which could be an ASIC or an FPGA, which does the MAC implementation. And when I say MAC implementation, that is where the core of the industrial communication functionality is happening. This could be an ASIC that enables PowerLink externally and is attached to uh, through uh, a SPI or any such connection between these two interfaces. Now with the TI solutions, what we have done is we have integrated a proprietary Texas Instruments core called the PRU ICSS and uh, along to provide one integrated SLC along with ARM uh, to be able to provide the multi-protocol industrial solution. The, of course, the obvious benefit is um, as you look at the system level, you have one single SLC providing the complete solution instead of a two-chip or a multi-chip solution for these multiple protocols. But the, the added advantage onto this is it's easily adaptable to changing standards, thus impacting the longevity of these system solutions. And the other benefit is as you look at the solution and how the scales, this could fit into the I.O. level or the control level or the HMI leveraging the graphics accelerator, providing the scalability not just from a processor core but also from an application standpoint. As we look at the PRU ICFS, uh, I've listed a few communication protocols uh, that are enabled today. But this core being software programmable, it's really flexible to be able to enhance and add more features going forward as well. So what does the solution look like? When you, when you look at the, the typical software stack layer, the, way the, the traditional model that we have in our industrial software development kit is we have the PRU ICFS on which TI provides the protocol firmware for these, uh, for say, PowerLink industrial communication. We have an abstraction layer where you have the protocol driver, which does the communication with the firmware, and then you have the standard stack that is provided or runs on the ARM core. Now, the reason why we have a very strong third-party um, base here is because we've observed that a lot of customers tend to use their own stacks, which they've developed for years together, or they prefer to partner with our uh, identified, carefully chosen part third parties to be able to leverage the stack that the partners may have developed for many years. Now, through this, we have a couple advantages here. One is to be able to validate our firmware quite thoroughly based on the APIs that the robust stack that has been maintained for years exists. And the adv other advantage is as you look at the integration and testing, uh, our customers also benefit from this level of integration. And on top of this, we typically have what we could define as the layer seven, where we have our own application layer, which leverages this deterministic, say, power link communication on your end equipment, be it HMI, PLC, or others. So looking at the ICSS, um, you have a 32-bit interconnect. And, and one key feature that I would like to highlight here is the integrated industrial Ethernet with the real-time MII port. Now, the, to make this highly differentiated asset in industrial, we've added the specific hardware to get maximum performance and flexibility out of this subsystem. With real-time error and link detection, additional register banks for real-time task switching, both of these are connected through a 1,000-bit wide broadside interface. Now, beyond industrial Ethernet, we, of course, we have 
um, industrial field dust enablement also through this PRUICSS. So you can retrofit this into more legacy systems, which are still dominant in the market, uh, like Sari pointed out earlier in terms of uh, serial communication, say Modbus through serial or Profibus through serial as well, or, or even CAN interface, for example. Um, we have the PRUICSS and we have developed the firmware. But to prove the technology, we, we certify these solutions through uh, the industry standards. And today, we are certified for uh, the popular industrial Ethernet protocols as well as serial protocols, such as Profibus. As we look at the industrial Ethernet, we are certified on Ethernet IP, Circa 3, EtherCAT solution, Profinet, RT and IRT, as well as PowerLink solutions. So looking at our portfolio a little bit deeper now, so we have the PRUICSS. What in our portfolio integrates this uh, communication multi-protocol solution on our silicon? The first we have here is uh, ARM Cortex-A8 based processor, the AM335X processor. This leverages a lower system cost, not just from integration of the industrial communication, but also with support for DDR2 and 3.3L memory, as well as integration of added peripherals as we look at uh, gigabit Ethernet with RGMII, as well as CAN uh, functionality. And again, our emphasis is to provide a system solution, which is why we offer low-cost development boards as well as the software to reduce the time to market or the development cycle as we look at enablement of these solutions. So looking a little bit deeper into what the Cortex-A8 based AM335X processor has, uh, it, the Cortex-A8 processor has a range of solutions which goes up to one gigahertz. And like I mentioned, it does come with an option to have a graphics accelerator to be able to render a display if you need to use this for an HMI-based solution. This is the PRU ICSS solution, which enables industrial communication, which could be multi-protocol, industrial Ethernet, or serial solution. Security continues to be a very highly discussed solution as we look at these automation solutions as more and more elements and nodes get connected. Uh, we definitely have an emphasis on this, and we have hardware accelerators as we look at these uh, security solutions. Um, as we look at the connectivity and IOs, we have the RGMII 2 port with switch, as well as USB support, and our standard IOs, which we have carefully chosen based on the market request, especially as we look at the industrial automated market. When we look at this, the range of products that we have on the AM335X, we provide a very scalable platform, which, uh, which we have six pin-to-pin -pin compatible devices, where you have a, a range of uh, uh, frequencies, which, which start from 300 megahertz and go up to one gigahertz. We have options with the graphics as well as the, our dual core PRU processor, which enables our protocols. We even have uh, different packaging options depending on our system needs to be able to provide the solution. As I mentioned, we have uh, different hardware-based platforms to be able to evaluate and get your system up and running using our solutions. While we have our low-cost uh, community board called the Beagle Board Black, we also have, from an industrial focus standpoint, the primary platform that we use for our development and certification is called what is called the ICE board, which is the Industrial Communications Engine Board, which is based on the AM3359 processors, which supports all the protocols, including the PowerLink solution. Um, so as we as we look at the AM335X industrial communication engine, we have focused the solution to emphasize on the 3359 with multiple protocols and have two Ethernet ports from the PRUICSS or from the two port gigabit Ethernet switch. These ports are MUX, so you'll be able to leverage either R of the solution depending on your system solution. 
This is the platform that was used to certify the multiple industrial Ethernet protocols and is our primary driving platform for our certification resources. Okay, so next we're going to look at the AOM437X processor, which is based on the Cortex A9. This processor, while it has the features that we just saw on the AM3C5X with the Cortex A8 processor, it adds another PRU ICSX core. And with this, one instance of the PRU ICSS has two integrated 200 megahertz cores inside that. Now, this second core is, is primarily added to focus more on the industrial drive market. Now, what that means is while you have one PLU ICSS core to do your industrial communication, we've added another instance of the PLU ICSS core to do the motor control. Here, you can integrate your master feedback protocols on the second core to be able to connect and control to standard motor control feedback algorithms such as NDAT or BIS or Hyperface DSL. So in essence, you're saving system costs on having external ASIC not just to do your, your communication protocols, but also to do your feedback protocols. In addition to that, we've integrated a nine-channel sync tree filter to be able to accommodate for current sensing, as well as an on-chip star ADC, uh, which is a 12-bit ADC, to be able to use that as required to be able to do current sensing as well. So what does the next-gen PRU ICSS in the AM437X bring? This for presence of quad-core for PRU ICSS, it enables more deterministic real-time processing and direct access to these IOs, which provides a very low latency for this communication protocol enablement and can simultaneously do Ethernet protocol as well as motor feedback protocols. We have uh, continued to develop and accelerate the hardware CRC module to verify the Ethernet payload uh, verification. And again, the integrated SYNC3 filter enables current sensing to be integrated to do precise sampling of, say, a feed three phase current input at up to 20 megahertz. Looking a little bit deeper into the AM437X processor, you have the ARM Cortex A9, which again runs up to 1 gigahertz. You, we continue to have the graphics accelerator to maintain the scalability as we look at the HMI market, and we've added the quad-core PRUI CSS to do communication as well as motor control. We've continued the emphasis on security and maintain the peripheral chipset here as we look at more IOs to be able to uh, connect to more nodes. What you'll notice here is that we've enhanced the number of PWMs we have here uh, specifically because this is targeted for uh, the industrial drives market. The, the SKU of processors that we have here, it ranges from AM4379X to 4379, where we have the range of processing power from 300 megahertz up to 1 gigahertz. And all the processor variants comes with the quad-core PRU ICFS enabled. But depending on which variant you pick, you would get either the standard or all protocols enabled. Looking at the tools that is available, we have our um, broader market tools as well as a very industrial focused tool which is called the Industrial Development Kit based on the AM4379 processor. Once again, the reason we have this variant is because we, we wanted to enable all protocols on one single platform. Again, this is the driving platform that we provide the Industrial Software Development Kit on. I wanted to show one uh, system level block diagram based on how a uh, single chip drive controller looks as we, as we look at the specific market. You can see here we have the AM437X. One of the ICSS enables two industrial Ethernet ports which can be used to enable say a power link industrial communication. And this integration provides the low latency deterministic enablement. 
and RGMII, a standard Ethernet port, could be used as a service port, although I've not seen this very typical as I look at the industrial drive. However, on the control, I do see this pick up. The serial port could be used to enable Profibus. This could also be enabled to ICSS, depending on your targets for the lower latency. And on the motor control side, the second TRU, ICSS, can be used via serial to do position feedback. And, and this is where you have protocols such as this, hyperface DSL, or in that being integrated into this to be able to do motor control. Now, when you're doing feedback or position, you also have your feedback as we look at current sensing, which is where we have the integrated uh, Sigma Delta filter or PWMs and ADCs, which provide the, the which a feature set to be able to do that. <clears throat> as we look at the drive market, safety is definitely uh, something that comes up more often than not. Uh, through the SPI interface, our IOs, you could have an external safety MCU to be able to enable that. Now, what we do integrate is functional safety over industrial Ethernet, position feedback, or even control as we look at that implementation on the Cortex A9. So uh, let's quickly look into the power link enablement on the TI processors. So as we look at the power link slave industrial Ethernet, what we have today implemented and certified on our AM3359 ICE board is we have integrated the OpenMAC firmware for industrial communication and the stack we have partnered with Port based off of Germany to be able to get the certified system solution. And the same platform, of course, supports multiple protocols as well. Um, this is EPSG certified safe solution and it reuses the PowerLink stack through a very compatible open Mac register interface. So if you're currently using an external ASIC to be able to leverage this integrated solution from a register and compatibility application standpoint, there will be no difference in adopting to this. The IO and drive profile stack, it, it's supported through our stack partner as well. And because of the nature of the silicon, it also enables a low power application processor. So quickly looking at our um, feature set, I, I want to highlight a few things here. One being, again, the register comp uh, compliant to OpenMAC specification. It has two MII ports with 100 MEBS with full duplex and half duplex support. And Sari pointed out in the first half of the presentation how it's essential to have two MII ports so you can define your topology as you look at the system. We have a three-port hub to be able to be inclusive of the RGMII port as well. Uh, 16 receive filters. It can also support a, trans a star transmission. Auto response features enabled. And as we look at the, the abstraction layer, hardware abstraction layer that we have identified for the PRI CSS firmware, it is completely independent of the OS. So you could use a real-time OS or even leverage a high-level operating system like, say, a Linux. Although our default system solution definitely supports the TI RTOS solution. It's easily portable to support open PowerLink or any other third-party PowerLink stacks as well. So quickly looking at the implementation architecture, so we have the PRU firmware with the two MIR ports, which provides the open Mac firmware. Then we have on the ARM side the abstraction layer, open Mac up hardware abstraction layer, which invokes into the APIs into the firmware. And on top, we have our uh, partner stack, and application could invoke through the stack to be able to leverage the certified PowerLink firmware. So a typical usage scenario that we have here, you have the open Mac hub firmware on the PRU ICSS and we provide a SysBIOS-based SDK. Now, this hardware abstraction layer can easily be ported from our Texas Instruments default uh, SysBIOS-based offer solution onto any other real-time operating system or a high-level operating system because it's been architected to be easily adaptable from uh, this hardware abstraction layer on our TI RTOS to any other RTOS as well. 
Um, so in conclusion, I wanted to highlight that we have a very comprehensive technical guide on industrial TI designs available on TI.com. Uh, we do have solutions for Ethernet power link on the Satara development platform, and in this case it's the N335X ICE board. And we have a more uh, system level solution as you look at the single chip drive, which can do both motor control and communication as an example. We do have pretty comprehensive solutions beyond these as we look at our multi-protocol solutions as well. Okay. Um, and thank you for your time today. Yes, yeah, thank you, Punya, and sorry. Um, we did want to go ahead and turn it over for some questions to any of the participants. Um, if you'd like to use the chat panel, the Q&A panel on your webinar to ask a few questions, I'd be happy to turn that over. Um, I'll give you a second to go ahead and do so. Sorry, it does look like I got a question that came in for you. Um, the question okay. asks, does PowerLink require special cables like EtherCAT? Um, PowerLink uses standard Ethernet cables. Um, okay. and so uh, because we have adhered to the Ethernet standard in every way, the standard CAT5 Ethernet cable will, will work. And then uh, just because of switch delays, we recommend that you don't use switches, but just buy an off-the-shelf hub, and that will work fine. Great. Looks like the next question we got in for you, sorry, was what is the advantage of using an open source protocol? So when you're using an open source protocol, you don't have to sign any terms and conditions with anybody. You basically, when you download the code, you own it. Um, of course, it has the advantage of that we, we've already certified the code, but if you decide to make modifications to the code, you don't have to submit it back to the open source domain. The code is yours. You, do you download it, you own it, you do whatever you want with it. Great. Punya, we got a question that came in for you. Um, what is the power link cycle time on the Citara processors? So the, the power link cycle time, because of the deterministic nature of the PRUI CSS and the way it has architected, um, our system solution that we have certified today on the AM335X processor can do cycle times as low as 200 microseconds. Uh, Sari showed an example of a system solution where you had the plastic use case where you were able to stretch plastic. I think that scenario had 400 microseconds, right, Sorry. So on our processor, right. we can go as low as 200 microseconds. Great. The next question we, we got for you, Pune, is uh, what conformance test version was this solution certified on? The Satara PowerLink solution was certified on the conformance test version 1.1.0. Um, if you visit the, the TI design, which is the TIDEP0028, we have more details on the conformance test itself, as well as a copy of the certificate that we got due to meeting this compliance requirements, as well as a detailed test report and benchmarking of the system solution. Great. Sorry, it looks like the next question goes over to you. Um, why is node-to-node -node communication important? Um, primarily, node-to-node -node communication, this is something that's unique to PowerLink as an industrial standard, but it basically allows you to do uh, synchronization across a network very, very easily. Uh, the minute a component puts out a frame, everyone sees that frame at the same time and can synchronize to that frame. So you can have several axes of motion running, and they can all be synchronized without having to have a mechanical synchronization shaft uh, and gearboxes connecting your system together. So it saves a lot of uh, time and money. Thank you. Um, Punya, to, to switch it back over to you, um, this question is, does the Satara processor PowerLink solution support basic Ethernet mode? Yes, uh, the, the and, and this support is very dependent on which stack is used. Um, the stack that we use to be able to certify our PowerLink solution came from our partner port, and that uh, the, 
the stack does enable basic Ethernet mode as well as multiplexing. And in addition to that, there it can it enables two external Ethernet ports and an internal hub, as well as an asynchronous MTU size of 300 to 1500 bytes. Great, thank you. Well, it looks like we're getting close to our time, the one hour. Uh, if you did post a question, we haven't gotten to anything. Um, we will go ahead. Oh, it looks like we do get one more that we have time for. Um, the last question actually goes to um, Punya. And the question is, does TI Satara board support open PowerLink MN stack? If not, is it planned to support or not? So. Like I, like I mentioned, we typically partner um, with, say, one partner to be able to validate our firmware stack. Now, we have observed an increased interest in the open PowerLink stack. Uh, so we are working through the details. So yes, going forward, we have plans to add support to open PowerLink on our Satara processor. Um, at the timeline, it's still being defined, but it's definitely coming in future. Great, thank you. Perfect. Well, like I said, if there's any other questions that come in, you have all of our contact information. We're happy to follow up via email. Um, I again want to thank Punya and Sari for being our presenters today, and want to thank all of our participants. And I want to thank our exclusive sponsor, BNR Industrial Automation. I also wanted to let you know about an upcoming event, the MCMA Technical Conference, um, that you may be interested in attending. It's happening November 3rd through 5th in Tampa, Florida, and it focuses on practical training for motion control and motor technologies. We'll have tabletop exhibits so you can connect directly with experts in the leading motion control and motor companies. Registration is open now, and we do expect to sell out quickly. You can find all the details on our website, www.motioncontrolonline.org, under the events section. We hope to see you there. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded, and an email with the link to the recording will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions, be sure to visit www.motioncontrolonline.org. And there also is a list of upcoming webinars. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day.